Welcome to the Books of Titans podcast, where I seek truth in the world's best books. I'm your host, Eric Rostad, coming to you from the beautiful Books of Titans studio in Franklin, Tennessee. My goal is to read 52 books per year and share what I'm learning. I'll talk a bit about each book, tie ideas together from a variety of genres, and share the one thing I always hope to remember from each book. Today, I'm going to cover The Road by Cormac McCarthy. This is book 31 of 52 for my 2022 reading list. Well, this is my second book by McCarthy. The first was Blood Meridian. And if you listened to the podcast before, you knew you will remember that I hated Blood Meridian. I gave it another try a few years later and, and then loved it. And so that was quite the transformation for me. But one of the reasons that, that I enjoyed the book so much the second time around is because McCarthy has turns of phrases. He has these odd way, ways of writing things that if you don't stop and ask yourself why something was written that way, you will miss a lot of the book. And so there's these, these things throughout the book where you, you really have to pay attention and you are rewarded if you pay attention to these things. And the same thing happened with The Road. And I will highlight that uh, in in this episode, but I just want to kind of set this up by saying that this book is written in the voice of the third person, and this third this this voice uh, is third person omniscient in the sense of that we know what the characters are thinking, what they're dreaming, and so that that's the vantage point of from which this book is written. The book is about a father and a son, and they are on a journey. And the journey is along this road that uh, they must, that they're always on this road getting to where they're, they're, they're going. The setting, though, is, is an apocalyptic setting. Something catastrophic has happened to where there are no birds left. Whatever happened killed all the birds, killed all the cows. So there are very few animals. Uh, there are very, very few humans left. And there's pretty much just gray Gray is the color of this book, and there is just dust and ash all over the place, and the ash kind of covers the sun to where you, you, there's not much growing. So there's no plants, there's no animals. The few remaining humans that are remaining are pretty much eating themselves. So they find a weaker member, and they just they go to town. And that's really the only method of survival, is to become a cannibal. And yet this father and son have made a point to they are not that they are the good guys and they're trying to find other good guys they are carrying the fire and they have this there there's this level of hope that they have that you know at, at different points the father has it more than the son the son has it more than the father but there's this hope that they're carrying to to find these other other good guys that's the setting that's uh that's kind of the general storyline and you're you're following this father and son throughout throughout the story the way mccarthy writes is so it's it's very short and sparse and it reminds me a lot of of graham green uh reminds me of hemingway in in musical terms it would be called staccato and that would be opposed to legato legato would be like strings just kind of weaving in and out very nice and slow but staccato is just like bam 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 and and that's how this the writing of this this book is mccarthy rarely even uses punctuation so if it's the word don't there is no apostrophe in it it's just d o n t all together and there's no um, quotation marks or or anything like that so it's, there's one, there's no chapters. It's just, it's just one. I, I don't even know if that would be considered a chapter. It's just, it's there. there there's no divisions of, of chapters. And so it, this all just leads to this, this feeling of, of desolation and danger. And the, it, it's an amazing book in that sense. It, it made me, it, it made me get teary eyed at the end. And I I cannot recall any other book that it that that where that's ever happened. So this this book hit me in such a way that that I I, I got teary eyed at the end. It's a book where you you must pay attention. Uh, McCarthy writes in such a way that he will have turns of phrases. He'll have these odd ways of saying things, and you you must pay attention to those things because he's trying to tell you something.
So I'll highlight one of those things, and it will relate to the book being written in the third person. I'll highlight that later in this in this episode. Uh, the other kind of neat thing about McCarthy uh, is that some of the main things in the book happen offstage uh, in, in the sense that they're not written about, but they're alluded to. And what that does is lead to some ambiguity. So what really happened? And you're never told as the reader what what really happened in this sense or, or, or in this scene or what what really happened in, in this person's history. And so you're left kind of guessing based on the clues that you gather throughout the story. And yet there's enough ambigu- ambiguity, in, and I saw this in Blood Meridian as well, but there's enough ambiguity to where, depending on how you think something eventually happened, that that changes how you look at the rest of the book that came before this this particular event. And it's really an astonishing thing, and, and th- it, I don't notice this a lot in, in other books, but... I've noticed it in both of McCarthy's books that I've read, where just that ambiguity for certain things that have happened can you, lead you to almost have a choose-your-own-adventure throughout the book of what do you think happened. And that makes it for some really fascinating reading and, and enjoyable reading, despite the the setting settings of his books. I mean, Blood Meridian is just kind of a bloodbath. And then this book is just this apocalyptic setting. But but you know what that does? It, it, it reminds me of, of some of the books that I've considered to be the best books for this reading project. Uh, and they're the books that are forged in suffering. And they are, they are nonfiction. So things like Man's Search for Meaning or the Gulag Archipelago, or the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass. The, these books tell of, of tragedy and horror that, that cannot even be imagined, and, and how the human soul has, has risen above this, has, has, has survived through this. So th- those are nonfiction books that have really impacted me. So if you're writing a novel, how, how, do, you, how do you get that same sense? And, and this is one way to do it, how McCarthy does it here, to where there, there has been a catastrophic event. Uh, you just get down to, to what, what is important here. And the way that uh, McCarthy writes about it is uh, on page four, he, 24, he says, The frailty of everything revealed at last. The frailty of everything revealed at last. So that's what an apocalyptic setting will do. You know, what, what is important? Is it what people think of you at, at that point? No, it's getting your next meal. It's it's surviving that day. So the frailty of everything is revealed, and then you you see, you, you follow this father and the son, and what what is of utmost importance. And, and if you're trying to survive, what 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 are you allowed to do? What are you not allowed to do? And that is the setting, and it just it really pulls you in because because it is that 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 horror of the the whole scene but it 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 causes you to look and to consider what are the important things here uh there are echoes of of this story uh in in it it made me think of other other books like the aeneid uh or just the story of the phoenix you know rising from the ashes so here's this father and the son and there they are they're on this journey, and they're everything around them is ash, and, the, and yet they're trying to survive. They're trying to carry this fire and and keep going. As for reading stats, uh, this is a two hundred forty one page book. It goes by very fast, and I, I read it in four and a half hours. It was over a five day period, and like I said, it's just you know it's very short. It's very to the point. You can get through it very quickly, but it packs a punch. So for the rest of this episode, uh, I will go into a a few things in segment two, the next one, I will cover some things that stuck out to me in the book. And then in segment three, I'm going to cover the one thing, my one key takeaway from the mood. 
Well, if this is a book you think you would like to read, I would encourage you to buy it from Landmark Booksellers in Franklin, Tennessee. I am the business manager at that bookstore, and we specialize in Southern writers. And so we have a photo of Cormac McCarthy up on the wall and uh, have quite a few of his books. So I'll link to that in the show notes. Uh, that is probably the best way you can support this podcast would be to to purchase the book from from Landmark. Now back to, to the book, I want to highlight first the code that this father and son live by. And even amidst the this horror and devastation and catastrophe, they they have a set plan. There there are lines that they will not cross. And here are some of those things. Uh, towards the beginning, the father tells the son, if you break little promises, you'll break big ones. And that's kind of a key throughout the book. Uh, just the way you think, the way uh, y- you speak, all of that, it, the, these little things will lead to bigger things if you if you let them fester. On page 47, the father tells the, tells the son, you mustn't say that. And again, the father says this quite a bit. So if they're if the the son is getting to a point of of saying saying hopeless things or or things like that, the father will always say, "You mustn't say that. You 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 must not go that route. Um, that will not lead anywhere good." They the father ha- says this. My job is to take care of you. I was appointed to do that by God, and I will kill anyone who touches you. So that's the father's mindset. That his his one main purpose is to is to protect his son father over and over I, I wrote down I would p- put the page number every time the father said this but he, he would he would always say we are the good guys and we always will be the good guys and the reason they were the good guys is because they wouldn't eat anybody and they were trying to find other good guys and they were carrying the fire they were carrying this hope amidst this devastation and catastrophe they, they were they were carrying that hope they they were the good guys and the father later on says, this is what the good guys do. They keep trying. They don't give up. The son at one point asks his father, what's the bravest thing you ever did? And the father replies with getting up this morning. And so throughout the book, you see this over and over, just this, this to survive, it's, it's a, yes, it's a daily thing of finding food that day and, and eating and, and, making it through that day. But a lot of the decisions and the mindset and everything are, are these small things. They're the, they're the little promises. And the father keeps trying to instill that into his son amidst, amidst everything that's happened. Uh, next thing that, that really stuck out is just, um, they, they have a gun, the father and the son, they have a gun and, uh, at the at the point we we meet them, there there were three bullets in the gun, but then there there are two, and then the father has to shoot someone who is is attacking or is is about to attack them and, and is up to no good, and so he kills this man, and now there's one bullet left in the gun, and I, I remember at that point in the book, at, I'm, I'm thinking you know they need this gun for for protection, but the the sad thing is, is the father, the, the reason he has that gun is ultimately for, for suicide and not for protection. He tells his son later on, if, if you are in a circumstance, you, you need to take your own life instead of trying to, to kill the people getting you because uh, they only have a few bullets left. Most of the time, if, if there's somebody that's going to attack them, one, they are likely a cannibal, so they're going to kill them and eat them. And second, there are multiple people. So even if you killed a few of them, uh, you wouldn't have enough bullets left for the other one. So I, that was such a shock to, to read that. The gun w- was not for protection. It, it was for, I, I guess, a kind of protection to protect yourself against what humankind would do to you if they got their hands on you. But again, this was a decision that was made beforehand, and the father would tell his son, you know, if it comes down to it, this is what happens. And the, the sad thing is, is when the father kills that that man to protect his son, he uh, he says this, a single round left in the revolver, you will not face the truth. You will not. So this is the father talking to himself. And, and the truth is that there's not enough bullets for both of them to to take their lives. Uh, there, w- there would only be one bullet for the son to do that, 
One thing I loved in this book was that the father would tell the son stories, and it, and it says he would tell the stories of, of courage and justice. And you just think that that also had to play a part in, in the survival, um, just the, the son hearing these, these stories. There's another part at the end of the book where the father asked the son to share a story, and, and he won't, and there's this, this discussion of are the stories true or not, and but do, do they have to be? The father asked that. And, and the, what the father was trying to do was instill in his son this, this justice and, and, and courage, um, and that the stories didn't have to be true for that. There, there was also just some beautiful writing in this book. Here were some phrases that, that I, I enjoyed. A dead perch lolling belly up in the clear water. Uh, I, I can just visualize that. I grew up in on the lakes in Minnesota and Wisconsin and <laughs> saw plenty of perch in that exact uh, situation. Another party says, the cold, autistic, dark. And then another one, the roads, cold, coagulate. Just a lot of different uh, different things like that in the book that is really, really neat way of, of writing. Last thing I want to highlight in this segment is that of the woman. Uh, in this book, a woman offers hope in, in the sense of if there is to be any continuation of mankind, of, of humankind, there is going to need to be a woman. And most of the women we encounter in this book are cannibals or not the type that, um, that you would put hope in for the continuation of, of humankind. And we do come across this one one woman who's who's traveling with with three men and she's pregnant and you're thinking oh maybe maybe here's the hope and then right after that and and I I'm not totally certain that the the two things were connected but but I believe they were the next scene they see a a child being being cooked uh the father and the son do and to me that that was the woman had had the baby, and then that's what they did with the baby. But uh, you you do see some redemption in in the book as well with with a woman, and that that was neat. There, most of the most of the people in the book you encounter are men, but uh, the, for there for there to be this hope, uh, there, there's got to be a woman, and just how there is a woman in the story is is just a neat a neat thing. Now into segment three and the one thing. This is the one, the one thing I'm still thinking about. So, like with a nonfiction book, my one thing will be the thing I plan to implement in my life that uh, that I read about in in the book. But with novels, what 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 usually ends up being my one thing or my one key takeaway is the thing that I keep thinking about and that that I can't get out of my head. So in this book, I'm, I'm going to refer back to segment one where I talked about the voice of the book and that it is in the third person. But on page 74, something shifts, and it's just for one paragraph, and I, I'm not completely certain what what happened. And so part of why I'm highlighting this in as my one thing is is I want to I want to raise the question of what happened. And I want to get your feedback and, and to hear what you think happened here. So I'm going to read it. It's a, it's a paragraph, uh, page 74. The dog that he remembers followed us for two days. I tried to coax it to come, but it would not. I made a noose of wire to catch it. There were three cartridges in the pistol, none to spare. She walked away down the road. The boy looked after her, and then he looked at me, and then he looked at the dog, and he began to cry and to beg for the dog's life, and I promised I would not hurt the dog. A trellis of a dog with the hide stretched over it. The next day it was gone. That is the dog he remembers. He doesn't remember any little boys. End quote. So for this be book being in the third person, uh, why is it all of a sudden in the first person? I mean, the very next paragraph starts with, he'd put a handful of dried raisins in a cloth in his pocket. And so we're back to the third person narrator again, t telling him us, us about the father. But all of a sudden, in just, in, it was so startling because everything else has been about the father. And, and there will be 
there will be dialogue uh, where where you're hearing the father speak in the first person. But this this seemed different in that this wasn't the father speaking. This was this was all of a sudden the it was written in the first person. And so I, I was asking the question why. And it's one of those things that I mentioned with Cormac McCarthy. You have to ask the question why. This is not a mistake. This is not McCarthy all of a sudden writing in the first person. So why, of all pieces of the book, why is this written in the first person when the the rest of the book is not? And I I, I looked online, and there's not a whole lot, but but there are some inter- interpretations of the book that that give a reason as to why this would be written in the first person. But I raise it because I, I am curious to hear what what you think and, and what you think happened and, and why you think this is in the first person. So the the thing that I saw online uh, about why this is in the first per- person is because it is it is one of the most important parts of the book. And it's something the father cannot get out of his mind. And it's, it's something that McCarthy wants you to stop and consider. So I'll leave it at that. I'll let you kind of think about that because if, if, if that's the case, you're going to want to read that paragraph and then you're going to want to think about the whole book again. And what does this change? Uh, what, what might this have, have meant for this to be uh, written in the first person? So to recap this this book has stuck with me. I finished it uh, a few days ago, and I just cannot get it out of my head. Uh, the same with with Blood Meridian. I mean, that that book just sticks with me. And the more you think about it, and the more you see and kind of question what you read, and perhaps if you take this view of what happened at the end or at another part of the book. Well, then you've got to rethink the whole book and did all the other parts of the book, does that support what you're thinking there? And it's, it's, so, it's so cool to do that. And, and it's just an amazing thing to know that, that McCarthy wrote like that, to, to have you think about things in that way. I probably missed a lot or interpreted things incorrectly, even in, in what I shared in this episode. If I did so, I, I would love to hear from you. I would love to hear what you thought of this book, what how you interpreted it, and and especially if you interpreted this this part in the first person in a particular way, I'd love to hear what what you th- what you thought about that. Uh, McCarthy's quickly becoming one of my favorite authors, and that's really funny for me to say that because when I first read him in 2017, I I hated I hated his book, uh, but but I am I'm very I'm very much enjoying what I'm reading by him. Uh, there, the first book that I read this year for the project was On Reading Well by Karen Swallow Pryor. And she has a chapter in that book about the road and the virtue of hope. So it's a kind of a neat way to to think about this book, too. So after after I read uh, The Road, I went back to that chapter in, in her book. And I recommend you doing that as well, just to kind of get another another view, another way of thinking about the road. That's going to do it for this episode. Thank you for listening. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear what you think of, of the road, the other interpretations that, that you may have of the book, uh, other things that stuck out to you about this book. You can follow Books of Titans on Instagram or Twitter, just at Books of Titans. And you can go to the website, booksoftitans.com. I have a, a ton of resources there to help you find the best books and to create your own reading list. I'll be back in a week or two and to discuss another book from my 2022 reading list. Until then, keep reading, keep learning, and keep listening. I'm out.